Have you ever felt like you're missing something in life? I think as people get older, sometimes they have what we call a midlife crisis. Any takers on a midlife crisis? That's, that's whenever a, a man goes out and he, he buys a, a Corvette. Never had a Corvette his whole life, goes out and buys a Corvette or something else perhaps. But uh, when you think about it, sometimes we have that. With young people that don't feel like they're getting something out of their life, oftentimes the question comes across a different way. It's, I just want something that's real. I, would you just please be real? Give me something that's real. And they just want something real, real in life. Well, Christ said in John chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, I've, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So we see that Christ came so that we could have life and we could have life more abundantly. When you think about the life that, that God has for Christians, it is the most abundant life because not only do we have an eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven, but right now we get to enjoy God's presence. Right now we get to have the peace of knowing our sins are forgiven. We have the, the joy that comes with knowing that there's hope. And that comes to a Christian right now that a Christian can enjoy those things. When we think of Christ coming that we, we might have life, we're reminded of another passage that talks about the reason Christ came. It's Galatians chapter 1, beginning in the middle of verse 3 and then verse 4. It tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Christ came so that he could deliver us from this present evil world so that we could live a life and live a life that is more abundantly. But the question becomes, how do we live an abundant life in Christ? How do we live a victorious, overcoming life in Christ where we're not going through life feeling like we're missing something? How do we have that life that God has for us? If you'll please take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 gives us some instructions that actually tell us how to live life abundantly and how to enjoy the abundant life that God has for us. 1 Peter chapter 4. Early in the chapter, it talks about all the things that God saved us from. And it has a whole list of horrible sins and horrible things that God saves Christians from. And truly, there is joy in knowing that once you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. And God's faithful who will give you the ability to overcome that temptation through him. But we're going to read today verses 7 through 13 in 1 Peter chapter 4. <clears throat> verses 7 through 13. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality to one another without grudging. As every man's received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as of the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. As we look at this particular passage, it starts out with the first part that we, we didn't read today, talking about how that God has delivered us from all these sins. Now God is going to tell us how we live that victorious, overcoming Christian life that God has for us. One of the keys that we see, though, is that we're going to have to set our affections on things above and not on things of the earth. That's from Colossians 3.2. Our focus has to be on eternal things. Because so many things around us are so temporary. They're not things that are, that are going to last forever. As a matter of fact, if you look to Scripture, you only find two things that are going to last forever that are with us here in this room today. One is people. You're everlasting. You're going to live someplace forever. So you're everlasting. 
The other thing is this precious Word of God. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8 tells us, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. So those are the two things that we see that are, are everlasting, and those are the two things that we need to invest our lives in. If you want your life to count, your life needs to be invested, invested in that. But as, as we think of how that we're supposed to set our affection on things above, we recognize that while Christ suffered in the flesh, he suffered so that we could be victorious over sin. Back up in the same book, 1 Peter chapter 4 to the first verse. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So if we're going to live a victorious, overcoming Christian life, we see that it's going to mean that we're going to have to have a certain attitude. There's going to be an attitude that's re required. Here we're told that we need to make sure that we arm ourselves with the same mind, that we have the same attitude. And that's the only way that we're going to, to see ourselves as having victory. And so what we would, would conclude from this part of the introduction is that when we live our lives in the light of eternity, we're actually preparing for today, for tomorrow, for the next tomorrow, and for all of our tomorrows. Because we're recognizing that for a Christian, the best is yet to come. Uh, we, we look forward to our home. And when you read in Revelation, you find that our home is probably going to be a whole lot more practical than a lot of people think it's going to be. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, there's two words in Revelation that talk about what believers do. They serve Christ and they reign with him. I was talking to someone about two weeks ago and they were saying, well, we really don't know what it's going to be like. Well, there's a lot of details that honestly we'd like to know that we don't know, know about the eternal state. But when you look, look at the book of Revelation, the first three chapters, it surely tells us a whole lot. Christian, you will be walking on streets that are paved of gold. You will be. There will be fruit up that is 12 different kinds of fruit. There will be a river. There will be a throne. That is the reality. What we see here is not the reality. But that is the reality. And as we set our affection on things above and we're looking forward to what going to, is going to come, we can have the abundant life God wants us to. But what does that life look like? There's five things that need to be in our lives if we're going to enjoy the abundant life that God has for us. Five different things that we, we see. First of all, if you will go back to our text in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, we would say the first thing is we need to pray. We need to stop and think so that we can pray in faith believing. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. What it's telling us is that things are coming to an end. This is not normality. Where we are now is not normality. Normality is the eternal state. This is coming to an end. As a matter of fact, when you look at that particular uh, word in Greek that talks about the, the, all things are at hand, it's in the perfect tense. And the perfect tense does nothing except emphasize the fact that it's like this is already here. This is a bonus. The end of all things is at hand. The eternal state is, is at hand. And then we're told to be sober. That means serious. What are we supposed to be serious about? We're supposed to be serious about our prayer lives. Did you know it takes a lot of work to be good at praying? Mm -hmm. And God wants us to work hard at being good at praying. It takes a lot of work to be, be good at praying. It tells us we need to be sober, and it, it's telling us we need to be watchful in prayer. We need, need to be aware of things. You know, our brother has preached a wonderful message, and we saw how that Peter learned the lesson that he needed to be aware that there's an enemy out there. Mm -hmm. And I can't make it as ugly as it really is. But the devil's a roaring lion. He has a plan for you, and his plan for you is uglier than you could ever imagine. He wants to chew you up and spit you out. But, Christian, God has a plan for you too. You can't imagine how wonderful that plan is that God has for you. God has a plan for you that's so rich and so glorious. Uh, hasn't God blessed you? Amen. Did you ever imagine how wonderful it would be serving the Lord? Did you ever wonder how wonderful it would be being a Christian? 
Hasn't God been good? And so we see, we see God's goodness, but we're supposed to be serious about prayer and our prayer life. And as we think of this, this seriousness, this soberness when we pray, I want us to look at a prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Whenever we pray to God, there's three things that God can do. God can tell us yes, he can tell us no, he can tell us wait, wait on that. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, the Apostle Paul, under inspiration, gives his testimony. He says, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon you. Prayer is a serious thing. And the Apostle Paul has something he wants to pray about. It was a thorn in the flesh. In other words, he was ill or he had some health issue that was bothering him. It was something in his flesh. It doesn't say what, it, what that thorn was. Some people have speculated that he, he may have had problems with his eye, maybe with some of the beatings and things he received. He had an eye that had been damaged and was oozing. But the Bible does not say that. And I think that's important for us because what the Bible does, does say is it says there was something going on in his flesh and he wanted it to be gone. He just wanted it to be gone. Some of you that I'm looking at today, there are things in your life right now that you just want them to go. You just, you just want them, you just want them to, to be gone. You want, you want to get past that particular thing. Remember, this is not normality. The eternal state we're looking forward to, that's normality. But we, we look at these things and, and we just want them to be gone. And here we have it called a messenger of Satan to buffet me. And we find Paul praying three times to the Lord that it might depart. This is Paul. This is the Apostle Paul. This is the Apostle Paul that under inspiration penned more books of the New Testament than any other person did. And we have the Apostle Paul going to Christ three times and God telling him, no. The Apostle Paul prayed and God told him, no. And it had to do with an affliction that was in his, his body. And you and I can sort of picture how the prayer might have taken place. Uh, when you have something wrong with you, what do you do? I mean, you go to God, don't you, and say, God, I don't like this. Would you please please heal me? Would you please take care of this? Would you please please remove this? And you ask God, God to do that. And the Apostle Paul goes back three times. And God gives him the answer, and the answer is, my grace is sufficient for thee. So when you have problems, either... God will take you out of the problem as you pray. He'll tell you to wait or he'll say, I've got something better than what you want. Mm. My grace is sufficient for you. Uh, you need God's grace more than you need this problem to be gone. You need God's grace. And so we find that Paul's conclusion was, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He said, I want God's power more than I want to be rid of this difficulty. I want God's power more than I want my will with things. That's the prayer of a spiritual man. Because you see, Christ is coming. He's coming soon. It's at the door, if you will. 1 Peter 5 verse 4 said, when the chief Shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Paul wanted to glorify Christ, and here we see that Peter, in like manner, is looking forward to that crown of glory. So the first thing we've seen here, if, if we're going to live life abundantly, is we need to pray. The second thing we find in verses 8 and 9 it says, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. The second thing is love. We're to love 
above all things. When it talks about the word charity here, it's, it's our English translation for the word agape. And all that is, is that is top shelf love. That's top shelf love. That's a love like Christ had. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's a love that gives even though it's not always responded to in a positive way. It's not the love of the Philadelphia love, the brotherly love, the love that gives so that it gets back. The love that pats someone on the back so it get, they, get pat, they pat you on the back. It's not that kind of love. But this is a love that's far deeper. This is a love that gives. And that's what love is. You know, when some of you were younger, now that some of you are younger, when some of you were younger, you probably thought, well, now, love is when I meet that special person and my heart goes pitter-patter, pumpernickel. I don't think so. Don't think so. That's not, that's not love. Love is a self-sacrificing desire to meet the needs or wishes of the cherished object. It's where we're willing to sacrifice what's important to us. It's what causes a mom to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and try to figure out what's wrong with a baby that's crying. It's a love that gives whether anything is given back or not. That's the type of love God wants Christians to have. He wants us to have top shelf love. Top shelf love that loves like Christ loves. How's your love going? How's your love going? And if we see here that we're to love above all things. And then it says, part of that is using hospitality one to another without grudging. That means without grumbling. In other words, when God blesses us with stuff, we need to be eager to share of our material wealth with other people. But there's a word we missed here in verse number eight, and I don't want us to miss it. It's the word fervent. When you start talking about fervent love, it's already top shelf love. But when you start looking at the word fervent, it means stretched out. It's a love that reaches and there's no breaking point. It's a love that, that reaches and stretches out. Are you stretching yourself with loving God and loving others? You know, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to have that as a goal that with God's help, for his honor and for his glory, I'm going to stretch myself. You know, God, show me how I can, how I can stretch myself by loving more. Show me how I can do, can do, that, do that. So we, we see that love, and, and we, we recognize the, the importance of love um, it, it, because we, we do see the hospitality that we're supposed to have. But it's been said that love is the most necessary thing. We get that from 1 Corinthians 13. You can have all these other things lined up in your life, but if there's not the love there, the love for God, the love for others, you've missed it. You and I have missed it when there's not that love. May God help us be good at loving. So if we're going to live an abundant life, we've seen, first of all, we, we need to be good at praying. We need to get good at praying. Secondly, we've seen we need to get good at loving. But now we see a third thing in verse number 10. And the third thing is we need to get good at serving. Verse 10 as every man hath received the gift, even so ministered the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. When you think of a gift, a gift is something you didn't do anything to earn. It's something that was given to you uh, freely without you doing any, anything to earn it or to get it. Uh, we think of how James tells us every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above from the Father of lights. So, we have where God will bless us with certain things at times. And you know, when we're in a crisis, we need to be sure that we're ministering to others rather than focusing on the crisis in our own life. Please don't raise your hands for this, but have you ever had a problem maybe with a car or something where you've been busy and preoccupied and God gave you a wonderful opportunity to minister to someone and you missed it? Okay, no hands. No hands for that. I think all of us have had times that after we got through the, through the crisis that we saw, which could have been something as simple as a flat tire, we thought, you know, I missed something. I missed a, div a divine appointment God had for me.
May God help us to live our life going forward where we don't miss those divine appointments that God has for us. So we see that we're supposed to serve one another. It says, as you've received the gift, even so minister to the same one to another as good stewards. A steward is just someone who's been, been trusted with, with a, something he's responsible for, that he's been given responsibility for. I want to tell you about a fellow, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind my sharing his name with you. His name's Jack Winkler, and I believe he's with the Lord now. But Jack Winkler and I were in the same, same church many, many years ago. His 16-year-old daughter was killed by someone who was under the influence. Car accident. That happens way too often in our culture. Way too often in our culture. And his 16-year-old daughter had been killed. Well, I went to the funeral home, and I wanted to say some words of encouragement to Jack. And, uh, you know, Jack, we're, we're praying for you. Jack, our heart hurts with you. You know, some, some words of encouragement for him. And I go to the funeral home, home like dozens of others, maybe over 100 people were. And when I get to the back of the room, they have the casket up front, and there's this line all in front of me. And halfway back in the line, going up to people, is Jack Winkler. This is his daughter whose body is behind him. And what he's doing is he's shaking people's hands. He's thanking them for coming. He's, he's telling them, well, the Lord's good. We trust the Lord. We don't understand this, but we know the Lord has a will. We know this is what God wants. And he is ministering to other people. And he's letting them know, this is something we can trust God with. You see, anytime something comes into your life and you did nothing to create it, you can be sure it's God's will for your life. Okay? And so God had given him grace. He had the grace to recognize that this was something that God had brought into his life. And he was busy sharing that grace with other people, even with his 16-year-old daughter's body behind him. And you know something? When you see that, you recognize he understood what verse 10 talks about. As you've received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. What a change that put on that particular funeral, funeral to recognize that God was in, in this, that God was there. But as we think of living life abundantly, we, we need to be good at praying, work at, work at pray, our prayer life, work at loving, work at serving, but also we need to work at speaking. Not only that we speak, but how we speak. We see this in the next verse, verse number 11. If any man speak, let him speak as of the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God does want us to speak. You're, if you're a Christian, you're an ambassador for Christ. As an ambassador for Christ, you're an ambassador of hope and peace. You can give people hope and you can share the blessed hope with them. You can also tell them how that they can have peace with God and peace in their own hearts. So as an ambassador of hope and peace, we are actually mouthpieces of God showing forth God's greatness and giving God glory. But it says if he speaks, speak as to the oracles, the utterances of God. You see, you and I have a lot of opinions. And you can hear opinions all day long. If you want to hear opinions all day long, just turn on the news media, on television. You'll hear lots of opinions. You and I have opinions about a lot of things. But it's a whole lot more helpful if we'll speak as to the utterances of God. If someone, I'm talking to someone and they have a difficulty and I, I, I'm uh, telling them, well, now, if I were in your shoes, what I think I would do is, well, first of all, I'm not them. Secondly, I'm not in their shoes. Okay. My opinion and your opinion really may not matter that much at all. It may not be worth very much at all unless it agrees with God's opinion. That's right. The one whose opinion I want to agree with is God's opinion. I want to find out what God thinks about the subject. But if on the other hand, when I'm talking to someone who has a need, and I say, well, you, you know, the Bible says, God says this in his holy word. The Bible says that. Now, God's word, word is the power of God into salvation, isn't it? It's quick and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And so God's word can make a difference in people's life. 
your opinion, my opinion, they're probably not worth any more than anyone else's opinion unless they agree with God's word. And this is where we need to be strongly opinionated when God says something about it. But I would, would maintain that probably with a lot of things that a lot of people have opinions about, uh, we probably need not have too strong of opinions if God doesn't have an opinion about it. Mm-hmm. And I think we, we need to be careful because we can get caught up in so many things that they take our focus upon what this verse tells us to do. We're to speak as of the oracles of God. We're, just, we're spoke, spokespersons for the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So we've seen we need to work on praying. If we're going to live an abundant life, we need to work on loving, serving, speaking. And last of all, we need to work on rejoicing. Verses 12 and 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. In this particular passage, as we look at it, we're told don't think it to be a strange thing if if you're tried. You know, you think of the, the different things that came in Christ's life when Christ walked on the earth. We're not any better than our master, are we? Okay. And we think of, of trials. As a matter of fact, if you tell me that, that uh, everything's going your way, uh, probably something's wrong. Either that or, or you're just waiting for uh, the next trial to come up. Because we're not supposed to think it is something strange when we have a problem. Now, sometimes when a tornado or a flood comes along, we may think it a strange thing. We may think, well, why God? Why me? Why this? Why now? And we may think that. But it's not a strange thing that we have trials, whether they're trials in our bodies like Paul had, whether they're, they're trials in our circumstances, whether they're trials in family, whatever the trials are, we don't need to be, be thinking of it as something strange. But it says to rejoice. This is the word Cairo. I, I think we think we know what the word rejoice means, but we don't always know what it means. It's speaking of being glad, being cheerful, being calmly happy. Calmly happy. It doesn't mean that what just happened to you or what is in your life is something you would even wish on anyone. But you can be calmly happy that God's in control. He has a plan. He's he's got this one. He's got it under control. And you can be calmly rejoicing. But then it says, inasmuch as ye are, so to the extent that you're partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall appear, ye may be glad. This word glad is the same Greek word as the word rejoice. They're both that Cairo, which means to be glad. And then it goes on, as if this were not enough, it says, also with exceeding joy. This is a completely different Greek word. It's speaking of not just being glad, but it's being exceedingly glad. Being exceedingly glad. Because when the circumstances and trials of life come, we're glad. We have the calm peace. But then, as we look look at this a little bit further, there's this exceeding gladness. There's, wow. God brought this in my life because he's building me, because he's not left me, because Philippians 1, 6 is being manifest in my life where I can be confident in this very thing that the one who's begun a good work in me will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. I can be confident of that and I can have, have that confidence. And so we see God's blessings overflowing in us with the abundant Christian life and then the they're overflowing towards others also. We need to be like those that have hope. Back in 1 Peter, again, backing up to the first chapter in 1 Peter, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, we live as those who have hope. We have a living hope. Why? Why? Because God saved us to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away, 
reserved in heaven for you. Christian, Christian, you have a lasting inheritance. You have a lasting inheritance. I mean, it's, it's, it's for keeps. Mm -hmm. Eternity is real. Eternity is more real than what we experience here. It's for you. God says this, this, this is what we have for you. But you know, we do need help from our loving Father. The very next verse continues with that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith and to salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. There's a loving helper. Do you know how much God loves you? I don't think any of us really understand completely how much God loves us. Think of how much God loved us. He loved us so much. He loved us so much. And then verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. You see, we need to understand that God is keenly interested in all he brings into our life. He knows what's going on with your life right now, and he cares. He's keenly interested in what's going on in your life right now, and he cares. He cares about, about those particular things. And so as Christians, we are able to go to God's word. We're able to see that God has a plan. We may not know what his whole plan is with everything, but we're able to see he has a plan, and because we're able to see that he has a plan, we're able to live our lives with patience and comfort because of the hope we have and enjoy the abundant life that God has for us. Romans 15, 4 says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. And then the best thing, I don't want to stop today without sharing, sharing the best thing, or at least one of the best things. Romans 8, 18 tells us that the best is yet to come. Romans 8, 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. In us. Wow, God loves me. And God loves you too, Christian. God loves us so much. So truly, we have every cause to rejoice. We have every cause, if you will, to rejoice with exceeding joy in our lives. You know, circumstances that come and they shatter your life, all they are is opportunities to really trust God. And God's trustworthy. As a Christian, I can recognize that every event and circumstance that God brings into my life is God coming to me through the blessed Holy Spirit to make me more like my Lord Jesus Christ. When I recognize that's what God is doing, God has custom, custom designed my life. And Christian, he's custom designed your life too. What a blessing that God takes so much interest in us. Truly, Christ loves you. But I'm afraid for us, the question is the same question that Peter was, was asked. Do you love me?